this hearing of the Subcommittee on Government Organization, Efficiency, and Financial Management will be reconvened. Um, I, uh, I know our ranking member, Mr. Towns, does plan on rejoining us coming back from the floor uh, fairly quickly as well. Uh, I do want to um, express uh, regrets for a number of my Democratic colleagues uh, who were uh, planning on being here but are now on their way to the White House for uh, a Democratic caucus meeting uh, with President Obama. And they asked me to extend their regrets in not being able to hear the verbal testimony uh, here today, but are glad to have received the written testimony from all of our witnesses. And um, again, we appreciate everyone's patience and flexibility as we juggle the schedule. Uh, we are delighted to have with us the uh, 47th Commissioner of Internal Revenue, uh, the Honorable Douglas H. Shulman. Commissioner Shulman, we appreciate your work and the work of your department and uh, your working with uh, this committee and members and staff as we try to address this very uh, important issue of how better to protect American taxpayers uh, from being defrauded uh, collectively by uh, tax identity um, theft uh, or, or uh, identity theft that's tax related uh, and also to uh, protect uh, each and every citizen who's victimized by these criminals uh, when uh, such fraudulent conduct occurs. Uh, I'm not going to go through your whole bio uh, in the interest of time. Uh, you've been very patient as we juggled schedules as the other witnesses have been. And so uh, we'll go right to your testimony. It is the practice of, uh, of the Oversight Committee to swear all of our witnesses in. So if I could ask you to stand and, and raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. So thank you, Commissioner. And the record reflect that the uh, witness affirmed that oath. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you for your statement. Uh, Chairman Platts, thank you for the opportunity to testify uh, before the committee on the important issue of identity theft. Um, before I discuss uh, the efforts the IRS has taken to combat identity theft um, and to assist its victims, uh, I just want to personally apologize uh, to the taxpayers sitting behind me. Um, I had a chance to talk with them and apologize to them personally. Um, I know that they had a frustrating experience uh, with the IRS. Um, as the head of the IRS, which serves 140 million individual taxpayers, I always stress to our employees that we need to walk in each taxpayer's shoes and understand their specific situation and needs. And while most taxpayers have a smooth, seamless experience with the IRS, we obviously need to do better with the taxpayers who are here today. On behalf of the agency, I apologize. And I've asked my staff to follow up immediately with each one of them to make sure all of their issues are, have been resolved. Um, let me talk about identity theft for a minute. First, I, I want you to know that we take the identity theft issue around the tax system very seriously. Regrettably, by the time that we detect and stop a perpetrator from using someone else's personal information, that victim's data has already been compromised outside of the tax filing process. I think it's very important to state for the record that all of the examples here today, the IRS is not the cause of the identity theft. Rather, the taxpayer's sensitive information was stolen outside the tax system, and the perpetrator then uses that stolen identity to try to get a tax refund. This is a growing problem nationwide, identity theft. Um, and we have seen a five-fold increase of tax-related issues around identity theft in the last five years. Um, in 2007, uh, because we saw this as an issue, we created the Office of Data uh, Protection, in Information Protection and Data Security. Let me, let me briefly highlight uh, some of the actions we have taken to try to get ahead of this. First of all, we set up filters and we stopped uh, about a billion dollars since 2008 of potentially fraudulent returns coming in due to identity theft. Um, we have also tried to set up ways to uh, assist victims of identity thefts. We put markers on accounts, which puts heightened scrutiny on those accounts uh, when uh, they came through. Uh, the key to those markers is setting up the right filters that block the criminals and don't put too much burden on the victims. Um, while not perfect, we have gotten a lot better. Uh, two years ago, 80 percent 
of the uh, returns that were tripped by our filters ended up being legitimate taxpayers. This year, that's almost re reversed. Seventy-five percent of the tripped returns ended up being the fraudulent taxpayers. So we're going to keep getting better every year. Um, we've also uh, this year launched a very promising program, which is we've uh, given 56,000 taxpayers a PIN. Um, when they file the return, it will go through if you have the PIN. If a return comes in with that Social Security number with no PIN, it will be blocked. I really think this is the future, and I commend my staff for being in front of this and working on it, although it didn't help uh, the folks who did not have um, a PIN. I could go on and on. We do a number of other things. We have criminal investigations. We coordinate with the Justice Department, the FBI, the Federal uh, Trade Commission, and I'm happy to talk about it in questions. Um, before I conclude, let me just turn to the written testimony of the witnesses who experienced unprofessional behavior on the part of some of the phone assisters that they encountered at the IRS. I must tell you in all candor, that all of my personal experience and the data that I review on a regular basis suggests that our telephone representatives on a whole are extremely professional and courteous. All of our customer satisfaction measures, those measured both by the IRS and by external third parties, show that while we run one of the largest phone centers in the world, the IRS manages to provide high quality service with a high degree of accuracy. With that said, I take these taxpayers at face value that they had a bad experience with the IRS, and I take this very seriously. I believe the conversations we have with victims of identity theft present unique challenges to our assisters. Often, it is during the initial conversation with the IRS that the taxpayer is told that they have been victimized. As we have heard, these can be very emotional conversations, and they are very unlike the majority of calls that we receive uh, on a daily basis with specific questions about your account uh, or the tax law. And so for many of our assisters, especially the ones on our general toll-free line, this may be the first time that they have received a call from a victim of identity theft. So based on this testimony and what I have heard, I am initiating a thorough review of the training provided to all of our phone assisters to ensure that they have the tools and the sensitivity they need to respond in an appropriate manner to victims of this heinous crime. Let me conclude by telling you that I realize that in the process of increasing our efforts to block attempts by identity thieves to exploit the tax system, there have been inconveniences and frustrations created for honest, hardworking American taxpayers. For that, I am deeply sympathetic. As identity theft continues to grow as a problem for our country, we need to do our part in the tax system to assist innocent victims. We have dedicated significant resources over the last few years streamlining the processes for innocent taxpayers caught up in identity theft. These efforts are starting to pay off, but we are going to need to keep working on it. And you have got my commitment that we are going to be focused uh, from this day forward on continuing to improve our operations in this area. I thank the Commissioner uh, for your statement um, and the, uh, the commitment you have made as far as going forward. I certainly am um, uh, grateful for your apology for those witnesses here today and all those who, um, who have been victimized and, and perhaps have <clears throat> believed they have not received the, the level of uh, assistance that they should have received, whether they are here today or um, uh, around the country. And you know, I, I think what you said here as far as going forward, you, you all captured in your, um, your April 6 uh, address at the National Press Club, and it was about continuous improvement, that since you joined the IRS in 2008, and, and in your own words, I have made it one of my top priorities to put the IRS on a path of continuous improvement to evolve, to get better. Um, I believe uh, we should perform the best we can today while embracing change so that we can perform even better in the future. And I think that is what this is about, um, especially when we look at the numbers in this area where we see um, identity theft related tax issues uh, jumping about 500 percent in roughly two and a half, three years, 50,000 or so that we are aware of to uh, over 250,000 in the most recent year. And I think that goes to um, your other statement about 
uh, the training uh, of the uh, of the staff who are on the on the one eight hundred number that is uh, for most constituents going to be their full, first point of contact. Um, that that uh, commitment you made to go back and evaluate and, and strengthen that training, um, because as we get more and more of these cases, as we're seeing, uh, that's who's going to get that initial call. And uh, as you reference uh, the, uh, the the written statements of the uh, citizen witnesses who will be testifying uh, a little later today, um, you know their description of the uh, of the treatment they received is is pretty outrageous. Um, and um, you know the uh, uh, not putting words in the mouth, but quoting them um, as we'll hear from um, uh, Lavonda Thompson. Uh, I spoke with the quote. I spoke with the most rude and discourteous person I've ever spoken with in my life. Um, uh, the um, another witness after dealing with a uh, IRS agent in person in a local IRS office. Uh, and uh, feeling so frustrated and, and how the engagement occurred, uh, I went out to my car and cried. I was very overwhelmed. Um, you know, this is a case where we have uh, individuals who were victimized and in, in essence feeling victimized a second time. And your acknowledgement of that and your commitment to, um, uh, to go forward to improve the, uh, the training of your staff is, is much appreciated. And in, you know, I'm one, as we've talked before um, yesterday, who believes in the ideals of public service and uh, am grateful for the work of all public servants, uh, and that includes all the personnel at the IRS who are out there each day trying to do a good job, and that we not paint with a broad brush and, and the misconduct of certain individuals to um, paint a, a bad picture of any and all IRS agents' um, personnel. We know that's not the case. So. Um, as a committee, we certainly will uh, be grateful to be kept in the loop as you move forward with those training uh, changes uh, or upgrades uh, so that we can uh, make sure that we are doing better um, with the uh, assistance provided to the, the victims of identity theft. Um, a number of issues I'd like to address with you. Um, you, you mentioned the, uh, the, um, about a billion dollars uh, in savings. Uh, that you've prevented from being fraudulently paid out, and um, that the filter system is now identifying of those that it kicked out, about 75 percent were fraudulent and that would have otherwise been paid out but for being caught. Um, do you have a number, roughly, what you think in, uh, say, the last three years, uh, best estimate of you've identified what was paid out fraudulently? And then uh, what, if any, of those dollars have been recouped um, since being identified? Um, let, me, let me just address. <coughs> we, we have the specific identity theft filters, which are pretty new and evolving. We also have very sophisticated algorithms and filters that kick out a whole bunch of fraud. We, we block over um, 2 million returns every year that, that never go out. Um, and um, a bunch of those are probably identity theft because they can be duplicate tins, but they just haven't gotten an identity theft uh, marker, so we don't know what that is. So we don't have a good number um, as of today around how much potentially went out that was we know was identity theft, um, but um, it you know it's something that that we're going to work on uh, going forward. Um, the other thing I, I just would mention um, <coughs> there were a bunch of statements in the testimony that assumed just because the innocent taxpayers' uh, refund was blocked that the perpetrator's refund went out. And that's not necessarily the case. There's a bunch of these uh, cases, it happens all the time, where we get a flag on the first one and we're working that. A second one comes in and then it gets a flag because it's a duplicate and then you've got to sort out who's who. And as I mentioned to you yesterday, we get some where someone has a purse stolen, someone gets their identity, they sell it to 20. Uh, people. Um, so we could get multiple filings with the same. Uh, it doesn't mean that any of those necessarily go out. A lot of times we're holding them all trying to sort out exactly who's who and who deserves the refund. It is, um, I understand that you don't have an exact amount, perhaps that's identity theft related uh, in the recent year or years. Uh, is there a number uh, that you have at this point of, of how many returns were filed? That are identity theft related, whether you know the exact amount or not. That that oh yeah, our um, 
our cumulative number is a little over 400,000 since we started tracking those, but those are the ones we put the marker on. So, for instance, the ones that are coming in this year until the case is resolved, you know, the marker is um, not on it because sometimes, uh, you know, one of the, the most common mistake uh, in tax filing is someone not transcribing their Social Security number right. So sometimes it's literally somebody misses a number, it goes in, that's not necessarily identity theft, it's what we call a dupe. Uh, right. Social Security filing, and so, but the cumulative number over three years has been uh, four hundred thousand that we've that we've uh, marked as having some identity theft related. Some there's never been a return, but we've found through other criminal investigation a cache of information that has a bunch of Social Security numbers. So we'll mark that. Some uh, the taxpayer uh, identifies. Some we find the way that most of the people who testified found out, which is um, when they filed, they realized somebody else had filed. The um, I know one of the issues that you, you kind of touched on that comes through in the testimony of, of where a fraudulent return was paid out, and then the law-abiding citizen submits and. Um, you know, then is told um, it's going to be four, six, or months or longer. Um, can you address that? If, you know, if if you know we have cases you know that have been brought to our attention where a fraudulent return was um, paid out within two weeks of an e-file being submitted in in say January or February, um, then the law buying system and that was based on just a name and and social security number and no supporting documentation done in the e-file. And they you know, they created a employer ID and income, um, but then the law-abiding citizen comes forward with all the documentation, W twos, um, you know, all the uh, proper ID to show that they are a legitimate taxpayer. You know, why um, is it four or six or you know? I think in the one uh, witness, it was uh, about a year and a half till they got their legitimate refund. Um, I, I know there's a manpower issue here, but you know, that seems pretty extreme that the, the victim has to, to go that long, you know, given how quickly we paid out the fraudulent payment. Um, so one thing I just really want to <coughs> clarify, because I think there was confusion in both a bunch of the press reports and other things, um, the first return that came in was received and put into our system. That doesn't mean the refunds were paid out. And so um, the, the refunds weren't necessarily paid out in all those. But then to address the question of when the real person comes in, what, what can take so long? Um, uh, you know, one is there were some staffing issues. And as I, I told you recently, we more than doubled the staff that's working those cases now um, so that we can get this addressed. I mean, frankly, we just didn't know there was going to be this explosive growth, and we were trying to balance budget cuts and you know, potential government shutdowns. We were managing lots of things during filing season. So once we found out there was growth, we threw more resources at it. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that um, in just this current calendar year? Or yes, that, yes, this, okay. current, this current calendar year. I mean, this is, you know, we're, we're trying to balance resources um, as we go. Second is there are cases, and one of um, I think the witnesses described a case where um, the person had, you know, had their W-2, had their employer, had their dependent, um, all those things. When you get all of that, I mean, identity theft has become a very serious organized crime. And it's one thing, you get a Social Security number, you file, you probably will trip a filter and get blocked. Um, and if you don't, when the real person comes in, they're obvious. But sometimes we write to both people. And both people come back with a driver's license with a Social Security number on it. Maybe they've gotten a passport. Um, they know the names of all the dependents. They know what the AGI last year was. That usually means it's some sort of a work-related crime or someone's gotten into some sort of payroll processing system where they get information. And when that happens, it can take a while to, to sort through. Some of the delay was we had some things sitting on the shelf waiting for our people to get to it. We think we've addressed a lot of that by putting more people. But sometimes when our analysts get there, they have to start making calls to employers. They have to ask for more information. And again, this can be 30 people um, all that they're, they're trying to unsort those cases. So those will always take really long. Yeah, understandably. Um, and you know, the, I guess the other thing I would say is um, you know, I did I looked into, there were a lot of public accounts about people, and without getting into any taxpayer, uh, there were lots of public accounts that I saw where someone said, someone told me it would take six months, but we know for a fact they got their refund uh, within a couple of months and a lot earlier than that. And so I, I think it depends on circumstances. With that said, uh, 
you know, it shouldn't take nine months. Um, it shouldn't take a year and a half, and we should get better at sorting this through. I think the pin I mentioned yeah. um, is going to be one of the real solutions. Everyone who testified here today, we'd like to make sure they get a pin next year, assuming the pilot works as it goes. Their refund will fly through. Um, anyone else who tries to use their Social Security will just be blocked. It's much better than the flag and the filter, which is a step in the right direction, but the pin could be the real solution here. Yeah. And, and I certainly understand where you have a, a fraudulent claim where they didn't just get a name and social security number, but they got access to, you know, all of that information. You know, so they're, they're filing correct status, you know, everything's good other than where the money's going. Uh, and I understand those are going to take a lot longer. Um, those where it is just that a name and, and social security uh, number. And, and this kind of comes back to the issue of the training of, of your staff and how they handle it. Um, and, and I think maybe uh, as you look at how you improve your training program is that that initial saying, um, we're going to do this as quickly as possible. Uh, hopefully it will be, you know, uh, you know, month or whatever you're going to think is the best case scenario, uh, but it could be six months. But uh, please know that, you know, we're going to be uh, giving you regular updates. And that is part of what I would call an internal control on the training side and the follow through because I, I really, you know, as, as when you and I talked um, yesterday, um, uh, my wife Leslie served on the Victims Assistance Board uh, in York County in our home community uh, a number of years back. And, you know, there, there's, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with victims of crime, you know, it should be one of our highest priorities and how we handle them because it's not just what they, you know, lost and, and here it's the taxpayer loses the money ultimately collectively, the American taxpayers, um, but it is a, um, a financial impact on the, the law-abiding citizen who has been victimized. Uh, and for those who especially who are really looking to that refund um, to pay, you know, whatever pressing bill they have, whatever it may be, there is going to be a financial impact. But it is really a, a mental health aspect to it as well. And I think that that is what came through to me, not just in, again, the witnesses we are going to have here today, but the other cases. I think we have 12 cases that we are currently working in my office uh, and having talked to my colleagues like uh, Mario diaz Bellard in, in Florida and around the country, um, is that um, you know, we really uh, look at these individuals appropriately, that they have been victimized by criminals. And, and so you know, we really need to prioritize how we go about. And I think one of those is that regular contact between your agency and those I individuals once they have been identified so they are not sitting out there waiting um, you know, for you know, knowledge but kind of get those regular updates. Um, I am going to uh, touch on uh, one other area uh, that you just mentioned before I turn to the ranking member. Um, and that is in trying to prevent it. And, and I appreciate that preventive approach. In fact, in your April 6th, um, statement at the National Press Club, I, I appreciated that you are looking at how to be proactive and not just catch them after the fact and, and do something, but to prevent fraud and other uh, misconduct. Um, and uh, I think one of the things you mentioned is about trying to have the, um, uh, EI, the employer I, uh, identification number and information up front, those W-2 data up front, rather than getting it, in a sense, after the fact and then trying to play catch up. And I realize that's a, a substantial engagement to pursue. And uh, I think maybe it was good that uh, Congressman Diaz Ballard being here as as an appropriator uh, on the subcommittee that directly oversees IRS. You know that yeah, as you're looking to make those type of improvements that will prevent fraud up front, that uh, we engage him uh, in uh, what those financial aspects may be as far as making those improvements. But you, you mentioned the PIN, uh, you know, the, the, the filler system and putting flags on. And, and I think the, at least one of our witnesses um, in the next panel testified that they, they were supposed to have been flagged and apparently were not properly flagged, so they were a victim of identity theft a second time regarding their refund, whereas the PIN approach seems like it would more likely prevent that. Where do we stand in that pilot program? And I think it was 50-some thousand individuals in the current year. And how quickly do you envision anybody identified as even a possible victim of identity theft being able to get that PIN to try to make certain that only they will be uh, receiving their refund? Um, so we're, we're really, we've got all the data now, um, although people still file 
um, after April 15th. Um, they just have gotten themselves an extension. But we've got most of the data in. We're looking at it um, and are parsing it. Like I said, I think it's very positive. Um, my desire would be to expand it dramatically and potentially give it to anyone um, who's been a victim. Um, we, for next year, we got to balance that against um, you know, all, all of uh, the demands. But I think unless we see something that we're not expecting to see, um, by next year, we're, we're going to try to dramatically increase that. Yeah, I, you know, my hope is that we can move that uh, that direction. Um, in fact, you know, one of the uh, not a witness here today, but uh, one of the victims um, that has submitted a written statement, uh, Pamela S. Lee from York, and, and without objection, going to submit her statement for the record. And in the name of full disclosure, uh, as I've shared with you before, uh, is a family member, uh, my uh, I'll say big sister. Um, although she's in the audience, she stands about what, 4'10", maybe, if that. Um, but, you know, she, she's one of these victims. And, you know, because of it being a family member, I'm most familiar with how her case played out. And, and the filter system, you know, is what really worries me, that if we rely on that, while I'm glad it's getting 75 percent of those that are kicked out are ones you want to catch, is um, how many are we not catching with the filter system? Because as in this case where, it's, um, my understanding, you know, it was a different filing status, uh, different employer, uh, you know, different um, address, uh, different dependents. I mean, there was one, what I would call, that Mario referenced earlier, one red flag after another that I would have thought that filter system would have caught and kicked it out to say, hey, something's askew here. Um, unfortunately, it didn't. And, and then when the written returns were received by the IRS uh, about a month after the fraudulent returns, um, nothing happened for another two months until the taxpayer, um, uh, Ms. Lee, uh, then contacted the IRS saying, where's my refund? So now it's three, three months after the fraudulent return was submitted and paid out in January, two months after the IRS has received paper documentation that hey, there, there's something wrong here, yet even then nothing had been done. And, and so that's why I do worry about the filter approach versus getting to the, to the pin and um, as a, a way to maybe better protect. And, and this may be um, too broad a sentiment uh, or thought. Is, is there the possibility of, of getting beyond just a social security number for each and every taxpayer, um, you know, what would be the cost of you know, a, the pin being sent out to annually that here's your pin, um, and so, uh, not just uh, you know the half million or so that have been a possible identity theft. Uh, is that something you're even considering, or is that because of the additional cost and you know whether it would uh, be effective or not? Um, if you if you don't mind, <coughs> if I could just address the two things about uh, that, that that you had mentioned. One is the um, that series of filters you said, why didn't it stop someone? Right, yeah. um, I just learned of the taxpayers, and obviously can't discuss individual taxpayers Understood. publicly, but um, there's nothing to say that it didn't trip a filter or that that uh, refund didn't get stopped. Um, and so we're going to look into all of these, but I will tell you, like I said, there's two million refunds that get stopped, and it's just those kinds of things if there's enough indicia there. Yeah. Um, and we have, you know, we change these every year. We're very sophisticated. The crooks keep, you know, testing all our tolerance levels. Yeah. But, um, you know, we're very serious about stopping uh, refund fraud. And, and I don't want to yeah. imply otherwise. I, I, as, I, as I've said to you, I know um, you want to prevent every fraudulent filing uh, and payment as much as I do. Yeah. And, and, and I know that your department uh, across the board shares that. And, and that's why in, in, in the purpose of this hearing is how do we partner with you to help you do just that? Yeah. Um, on, the, um, on the PIN, I mean, it's an interesting idea. I mean, we're, as you know, um, everybody's in uh, very tough fiscal times. My guess is it would uh, be very expensive. We're looking first to expand the PIN, A, first make sure it works. 
Second, expand it to the group of people most likely to have um, one of these problems. Um, right now, the Social Security number is what's used. Um, I think it's been an overstatement in some of the testimony uh, submitted today that all you need is a name and a Social Security number and you automatically get their refund. There's a lot of things that go into uh, looking at that. With that said, um, yeah. You know, I'm very open, uh, you know, I, I, as you quoted from uh, a speech earlier this, this year, we should always be looking at how we do it better. Um, and it's certainly something as identity fraud grows, we're going to have to figure out how to stay on top of it. The, um, I, I, I do appreciate that it's you know, not necessarily that simple, um, but um, I'm looking for, you know, I've got too many uh, pieces of paper in preparation for today's hearing. but. Um, I, 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 that is a statement from a conference call with the IRS employees stating that to um, committee staff that Social Security number and name is all you need, uh, you know, the e-file, and, and that it is that simple. So that's not just citizens, witnesses making that statement. That is an, uh, one of your employees saying that to my committee staff. Well, I'll look into um, both the uh, employees who are rude to people on the phone and that employee <laughs> then, because um, there's a lot more that goes into issuing a refund than just yeah. a name and social security number. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, I, I, you know, Want to identify the individual here, um, but no, I I'd, take it at face value that what glad, you said. glad to share that information with you. Um, but I'm uh, finding my place here. Um, I'm not finding the exact one, but we'll we'll get it to you, and and because that that seemed to be what was being conveyed to us. A final final question there, and I'm going to yield it to Mr. Towns. Um, is there any consideration? Again, we're looking at ways how to prevent this wrongdoing. To, to stop the criminals, protect the innocent. Um, you know, I know uh, in, in some of these cases, uh, and I don't know if it's consistent or something that you've identified as a, as a consistency in the fraudulent claims, they were filed in, in January electronically, um, which um, is before most Americans, I know I, I never get a, a, a W-2, you know, till the end of January, the last minute from current federal government as my employer or from previous employers. Is there any consideration that th that is a, a specific red flag that anybody who is filing electronically in January um, that we look at with extra scrutiny because, you know, of the propensity that, you know, they are trying to beat the law-abiding citizen who hasn't yet got their W-2s, so they have not yet or not yet, I think, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, um, and I may be wrong, but that most Americans are not able to file to at least the end of January or into February, because till they get their employer information and then go forward and submit everything, that that would be a specific red flag that anybody filing electronically you know, that early, you know, would get extra scrutiny. Is that something that you would consider? Um, you know, I guess there's two things about that. One is um, a lot of the people who are, um, you know, the, the common perception is April's when everyone files. The reality is, you know, our peak starts January, February, and there's a lot of people who file who are, a, as you discussed earlier, people who are really counting on that money and yeah. they go get from their employer. Because most employers, um, especially large employers who employ, you know, large chunks of lower income workers can make the W-2 available earlier. And so there's a lot of people who file who are some of the neediest taxpayers who really need um, yeah. that money. Second of all, um, as we talked about yesterday, um, I just want to be I, we have seen no nexus between electronic filing and this identity theft tax related fraud because you can you can uh, get your your return in just as quickly um, by uh, sending overnight mail to yeah. us um, and the speed issue a lot of times it's about you know whether you get a check or direct deposit and we have to send something to FMS so um, it's again it's everything's on the table and I certainly would look at anything. Um, but um, usually the time is not the issue because we actually, the thing that nobody wrote about, and it, obviously there wouldn't be a hearing and a lot of interest in it, but um, we stop lots of people who the legitimate taxpayer filed, got their refund, never knew uh, anything happened, um, and then the court comes in later. And we block those too. Obviously, right. that those ones aren't yeah. devastating to the victim. The victim good, good news fine. doesn't sell, yeah. right? Um, uh, so, <laughs> so, but it's certainly something you know we look at. Um, what I will tell you is we have you know 
technologists, statisticians, economists um, who continually are looking at our screens, refining them year after year, looking at patterns, working with our criminal investigators and other people. Um, and these, you know, I get briefed on them all through December to make sure we test them. We test them against last year's data. We test them throughout the year. And so we're looking at these uh, filters very carefully, and we're trying to get as um, uh, Jim White from GAO testifies, you know, the key to these things is um, stop the bad returns and don't burden the uh, honest the taxpayers. Tax yeah. The, um, am I mistaken, though, if you file a paper return, then you do have to have your W-2s? I, I thought when you file an electronic return, you, you don't send any W-2s in you know, with that because you're doing it electronically. But if you file by paper, I thought you then did have to file your, your W-2s with the, the, the uh, return. The electronic return usually has. You can do it uh, electronically. Next year, we've been working on our e-file. Next year, we'll be able to actually PDF any attachment to an electronic return. But, but I mean, as far as the, the, that identity theft is paper or electronic, isn't it harder to do it with paper because you have to have those W-2s uh, attached? A lot of people get them late. Um, what I can tell you is we look, we screen with the same material on paper and electronic. Okay, because that, that's what I'm looking for, that nexus that you referenced. Um, and, and I would encourage you, and, and if, you, um, if you see anything with the, uh, that 75 percent of those that you did kick out and were fraudulent, um, you know, that analysis, you know, were, was a large percentage of them in January, you know, and, and, um, and what percentage of them was uh, electronic. If, if your staff could follow up with the committee on those two specific issues, sure. that would be great. And, and my ranking member has been very tolerant of me being uh, going very long here. Uh, you know, to the great uh, former chairman of the full committee and the um, ranking member of the subcommittee, a gentleman from New York, Mr. Towns. Right. No, thank you very much. No, I think that, um, uh, you know, your questioning, you know, I think is just so important to try to get to the bottom of it and, and not get involved in terms of a blame game because we're all in this together. I mean, and I think that, uh, so your questioning, I thought, were really, you know, right on point and, um, uh, and to the point, <laughs> you know, uh, because, you know, uh, my, my, my uh, you know, I'm always concerned about if people do things and get away with it you know, then they will sort of almost encourage them to do it again um, because if nothing really happens, and then, of course, others hear that, it ha that they did it and nothing really happened. So I guess the point that I want to ask you, um, um, since 2008, how many prosecutions have there been? Um, so I... I actually don't have, I'll have to come back okay, to you, I don't have right. a cumulative number, but I, I, I put in my testimony and mentioned earlier. Um, Mr. Chairman, can we keep the record open so we can receive that? Yep. Yep. Um, just last year, um, we took to full investigation and recommended to prosecution, and we don't do that if we haven't coordinated with the Justice Department, um, prosecutions that, uh, of people who had stolen 50,000 identities that had been used in, in tax crimes. And so when we prosecute, we obviously, like every other agency, um, you know, we've got a very small part of our operation as a criminal investigation mm -hmm. uh, division. We have to spread it across terrorist financing, offshore tax evasion, uh, any number of things. As this problem's grown, we've put more resources and plan to continue to put more resources into it. And we try to find uh, prosecutions, A, where we can get the proof, um, but uh, importantly, the ones that impact large numbers um, of, of taxpayers is, is, frankly, the ones that U.S. attorneys will take and work with us on, et cetera. Um, and so if you look at 50,000, I think the number was actually 56,000 taxpayers who were affected with the prosecutions that we took all the way uh, through our criminal investigation chain, um, that represented, um, you know, more than a quarter of all the identity theft that was identified, which is a pretty high number um, for any federal or, frankly, state or local investigator to be able to follow up on that percent. Would you know the rate of conviction? What's that? Would you know the rate of conviction? Um, have any idea? Very high rate of conviction. I believe it's in 95 percent, but let me get back to you for sure on the record. Right. How much of the fraudulent paid money has been recovered from thieves? Um, 
so every year we block billions of dollars of fraudulent refunds. We we've blocked about a billion over three years with identity theft. I um, mentioned to the chairman we haven't tracked specifically identity theft numbers um, related that has gone out and what we've gotten back. We haven't started tracking that. We plan to as this as this problem grows. So I, I don't have a number for you, Mr. Towns. All right. You know, my concern is that you know sometimes when we don't have the resources. You know, we know that there are things that should be done, you know, but we don't do them because we don't have uh, the resources, you know, to do it. And of course, sometimes uh, in that process, um, you know, the wrong kind of message gets out. So uh, I know that, you know, as the uh, commissioner, that you just can't come up here and bang, 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 saying that you want money, money, money. But the point is that I think that when you see a problem, that I think that it becomes our responsibility here to give you additional resources to be able to go out there and fix the problem. Because if a person is expecting his or her return and then they don't get it, and then all of a sudden they can't get an answer because really somebody else has gotten it, and the frustration around that and the problem, you know, uh, uh, to me is something that we need to really take very seriously, and I'm talking about members of the Congress as well, and I agree with the Chairman. I was so happy that we had one of the appropriators here uh, today because, you know, uh, and I think that um, if you feel that you need additional resources, you know, don't hesitate to uh, make that case because I think at the end we're going to save money by you doing that at the end of the day based on what I'm hearing and what has been said here, that, um, that if we spin it to fix it, then in the long run, we'll be much better off. And I know how difficult it is to make the case for, for resources, especially in this atmosphere and climate, but sometimes we have to do that in order to be able to correct the situation that we now find ourselves in and to make certain that people have uh, the confidence and, and not to be worried about whether, you know, um, somebody's going to get my return because of my identity. And let me ask you, other what department uh, really covers this in your, in, in your shop? What department, the name of the department that handles this? Handles, I'm sorry. That handles the, um, the claims in terms of the identity. Uh, what the, you, you must have a department that takes a look and handles the identity theft. What is that called? Oh, well, we have, um, uh, we have this centralized offer, Office of Information Protection, Privacy and Security that sets all policies and coordinates um, the fraudulent, most of it is in our wage and investment division, which deals with individual taxpayers. That is where all the service issues are that we have talked about uh, uh, with the victim's uh, testimony. And then our criminal investigation is the arm, obviously, that follows up on uh, fraudulent schemes that we see. Right. Now, um, was that the department that I noticed some cutbacks? Was that the department was cut back? Well, we had some cutbacks in every, um, every part of the IRS this year. Right. Because, you know, I, I'm really concerned about um, uh, making certain that you have the resources to do the job that needs to be done. And that's really where, you know, and I think sometimes, you know, we involve in situations where, you know, we have a problem and we know that resources are actually needed to correct the problem, but we do not deal with it. And, and we're guilty of that here on, uh, in the Congress. So I want to let you know that uh, I stand ready to push, you know, to be able to assist you to get what you need to be able to correct the situation because, you know, if, if it's going to grow if you don't. And that's the problem. You see, when people do something and they get away with it, they tell others. And then it gets bigger and it gets bigger and bigger. And then the problem, you know, uh, becomes one that uh, becomes a lot more costly to be able to handle. So I think that if we sort of can move forward now and correct some of the things that are going on, and send the message forward that this is not something you do. You know, if you do this, you're going to spend time in jail. Because, and I think that that point has to be made because if people do it and they get away with it, they're being encouraged. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. What, what I will say, and I'm obviously, uh, you know, I'm biased because I'm the Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service and responsible for um, this agency, um, but this problem 
is a good illustration um, of why um, you know I advocate for the right resources um, for the IRS. Because on one side, we need to have the service resources to quickly process the returns and the refunds for the victims. And on the other side, we need to get the enforcement resources to pursue this kind uh, of crime. Um, the service resources, I think, are fundamental because every American is expected to pay taxes. So this isn't a choice. This isn't an optional department. Um, and we owe it to the American citizens to treat them right. Um, the enforcement resources are just obvious from an economic standpoint, where there's a huge return on investment. Um, you know, we, we return for our enforcement programs anywhere from 8 to 1 to 23 to 1, uh, $23 for every dollar we spend. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't even count. That's conservative accounting that OMB and CBO have come up with. That doesn't uh, count the deterrent effect of people seeing and just never doing it to begin with. So um, this is a, a kind of microcosm of why um, you know, we, we always argue this agency is a little different, collecting the money for the government, because it's got a huge return on investment, and an, a real obligation to serve every taxpayer in a way that's dignified and respects their own individual situation. But the problem, you know, I, 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 Mr. Schumann, is that people compare you with other agencies, like, for instance, they talk about in terms of American Express, they talk about, uh, uh, and, and they say, well, this person went to purchase something with the, the American Express card, and they call me. You know. But the point is that they can do that, because they have the staff, and they have the system in place that they paid for uh, to be able to raise these kind of flags. So that's the point I want to make, and then, you know, and, and because you're going to be compared with them. You know, I'm, in fact, some of our colleagues have already done that today. And I was on the floor of the house, and a guy came over to me and says he didn't understand the problem because of the fact that, and he went on to talk about in terms of how the credit card a company woke him up. He was asleep two o'clock in the morning, and they called him and says, "Are you making this purchase?" You know, I mean. But the point is that in order to do that, you have to have staff, you have to have resources, and that's the difference. And I also told him there's a big interest on that card whatever he has. I mean, there's a big interest on it. And uh, so therefore, they can hire staff, they can do things and say things. And, uh, and we just want you to know that we sit here, we're not just going to you know, blame, and, but we want to work with you. And uh, we think that um, together that we can do better. That's what I'm saying. And I know that in, in order to do that, we will have to do some things on this side of the aisle. And other than just saying, you got to stop it. You know, we have to help you stop it, and I'm prepared to do that. Appreciate it. On that note, I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman, and um, Commissioner, I will wrap up quick for you. Um, just a, a couple of quick follow-ups. Um, one is on the, the issue that the uh, ranking member raised on the prosecutions. Is, is it, um, there was a, a press story in the, uh, in the Sun Sentinel uh, in Florida, uh, end of April, that identified, and I'll read it verbatim, prosecutions for identity theft-related tax fraud are rare. Agents for the Internal Revenue Service who are responsible for criminal investigations have pursued just 412 such cases nationwide since 2007. Um, now, they're specifically referencing identity theft-related tax fraud. Uh, I, I take it that you believe that's an inaccurate uh, number? Um, as I told Mr. Towns, I don't have the cumulative number with me, but I'll okay. get back for the record. If we um, could. Uh, but I think the important thing is a lot of these people are, are committing, uh, there's one criminal with thousands of taxpayers. Exactly. So that could represent a that lot. That may not mean one, um, per, one victim might have been 100 victims. Yeah. Per, right. But that, that may very well be the number. But you know, what I'm telling you is as this problem grows, we're going to devote more resources and that, you know, our, our prosecutions will, or our, our investigations will continue to grow and our recommendations to justice for prosecutions will continue to grow. And, and, and that kind of follows up with what Ed just said is um, as a, a committee, we're an authorizing committee, an oversight committee, we're not appropriators, but we're glad to work with our friends on appropriations and, and kind of two areas that I think you're looking at doing. One is your, your manpower commitment to the victims so that after being victimized by the criminal that the government does right by them so it's not six months or nine months, you know, until they get their legitimate and that's, you know, a, a manpower issue, but also a manpower issue of, of going after the criminals. 
And because if, if that number is accurate, 412, when we talk about the number of identity theft cases tax related going from 50 some thousand to 250 some thousand, obviously that's a very small percentage of prosecutions if, if we're accurate in those numbers. And that, a question on the prosecutions, uh, I know that in, excuse me, in statute, IRS, you, you're um, understandably restricted pretty significantly in what you, information you can share with anybody because you're protecting very yeah. personal data. And are there statutory um, restrictions on you that in some way are preventing your criminal investigation division in working not just with justice but with local law enforcement? Because I understand that, you know, as with some of the cases you know, we, we have heard about or we're going to hear about here today, where it's you know, 3,000 or 4,000, and it's not multiple, but one person defrauding using one, you know, name and, and mm -hmm. security and information. Um, when that goes into the Department of Justice and they prioritize all these criminals are going after, that's probably going to get pretty low in that totem pool because of the amount. But for local law enforcement, you know, you know, they prosecute shoplifters who maybe stole a hundred dollars worth of goods. Uh, it's something that they know, they know how to do it. Is there anything that prohibits the, the agency from working with local law enforcement so that we can, when we, we know who the person is, they, they don't get the message, as, as Mr. Towns expressing concerns, that, hey, as long as I don't ask for too much, each year I can pocket three or four thousand dollars because they're never going to come after me. And, and we're sending that message that, hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go and just don't get too greedy. And as long as you don't get too greedy, you're safe. I think to combat that, we've got to engage, I would contend, local law enforcement I, you know, I don't know if, if here today you know if there's anything that prohibits or restricts it or hinders that. Um, what I will say is uh, I think some of the articles might have overstated the restrictions, but there are some restrictions around specific information. We need to give information that's pertinent to the investigation, to know where the investigation is going, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I always tell people I got sworn in um, as IRS commissioner. When I came back to the office, the people who talk about the laws around taxpayer privacy were in my office. Um, just as an example of how seriously this agency takes data protection. Um, mm -hmm. And there are very restrictive laws um, because we're holding very sensitive information uh, about taxpayers. Um, we can, though, do coordination with other law enforcement agencies. It's not always just let, you know, control our databases, look at everything, or share everything that comes in. Um, but there's you know, specific things we could do. We'd be happy to have uh, further conversations about exactly what, you know, wh where there could be some restrictions. Yeah, if, I, if, uh, if you don't mind, I, I also just want to be clear, because I might not have been clear earlier. Um, when you said um, 250 uh, cases of identity theft with only 400 prosecutions. The, the 250,000. Um, yeah, yeah. What I was, and that those numbers seem skewed. Um, one is 250,000 was the flags that were put on. We put some of those on because we happened to find, um, you know, a database. Um, or someone called and said, my wallet was stolen. Um, and so those aren't necessarily anything. There hasn't been a crime committed. It's just a flag so that we can put it through more screening. Okay. And second of all, you know, even though um, last year it was 116 investigations, 41 of them ended up with recommendations for prosecutions, that was still 50,000 taxpayers. So the number was more like 50,000 for 200,000. Just and, and I don't know that I was clear earlier. Right. Because uh, again, because of the likely prosecutions at this point. Are those more large schemes involving multiple or you know significant numbers of taxpayer uh, IDs being taken? So the number of cases might be small that you're prosecuting, but the impact is that fifty thousand number. Yeah, and, yeah. And I just want to make sure I was yeah. I was clear in okay. my explanation earlier. The um, uh, one one other item, just if you can follow up for the record, when you're uh, my early questions about. Of those identified and you know and kicked out as being fraudulent, you know that there were how many were e-filed, how many were in January. Also, uh, the issue of how many were um, asked to be refunded in the form of a debit card uh, versus uh, a check or a direct deposit. Um, again, I, I'm I'm looking trying to help you know, you know personally so I can you know better work with you and your your agency of um, you know what what is you know common issues here that we need to try to look at and it comes back ultimately to the broad issue of internal controls and how do we 
ratchet up our controls to address whatever is most common. And knowing, as you well stated, that the criminals are always going to try to stay, whatever we do, they're going to try to then get a step ahead of whatever we did. But um, you know, if we, if we could have that information about the debit card refunds that are identified, that they, they were asking for refunds, and you caught them, and, uh, but they were looking to get it on a debit card. Um, and again, um, the, the belief that that maybe is easier to then get away with it versus if they know they got to go to a bank and have some kind of contact with a bank to get that fraudulent refund from that bank. So um, with that, uh, Ms. Johnson, do you have any other questions? Um, I'm going to uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, con conclude by saying, you know, well, I think um, as you've referenced and, and in a written testimony, and, and we're about to hear from our other witnesses, uh, we, we do have a lot of progress to make, or work to do. Uh, also want to recognize the progress you, you have made uh, and the uh, commitment that you're making that you, you know, uh, your understanding of this as a growing problem isn't because we asked for this hearing. It's because you're, you're seeing the data as we're looking at it um, and are out there, you know, trying to, uh, to lead the effort forward in a positive way. Um, and uh, for those hardworking uh, public employees in the department who are providing great service day and doubt, we're grateful for them. And, and hopefully those who um, um, haven't provided that level of service that you clearly want to be provided, that you know, they're, uh, they'll learn from their mistakes and do a lot better in the future with, uh, with the American public that they interact with. So, but thank you again for your testimony. Look forward to continuing working with you and your staff. And, uh, and our thanks for uh, being flexible here today with the schedule. Thank you, and, and if, if you would mind, I, since I was up here at 12 and I'd hoped to be here when the other witnesses spoke, I'm going to have to step out, but my team yeah. is going to um, stay to follow out. But and we've um, shared you all do have my apologies again um, for having a frustrating experience with the IRS. And, and uh, you know, we, uh, we appreciate that uh, your understanding of the testament from the written, and as we discussed yesterday at, you know, pretty good detail, the, the subject, you know, the message of their testimony, and uh, your staff's willingness to stay with us is also appreciated. So thank you, Commissioner. And we'll take a, about a, a two-minute recess while we get the next panel uh, situated and then, uh, and then begin.
We'll uh, continue with our second panel. Um, and um, we're, we're honored to have uh, four individuals with us. First, uh, Mr. Jim White, Director of Strategic Issues at the Government Accountability Office. And Mr. White, we appreciate not just your presence here today, but day in, day out, you and your colleagues at GAO and the important work you do for, for uh, all of uh, our nation, but especially for Congress and the resources uh, that you bring to um, our work here on the Hill, uh, as well as three um, citizen uh, witnesses, uh, unfortunately, who have been victims of uh, identity theft as it relates to um, their tax filings. Uh, we have uh, first uh, Sharon uh, Hawa, is that correct, uh, from uh, the Bronx. Uh, we have um, uh, Lori Petraco uh, from uh, York, Pennsylvania, and Ms. LaVonda Thompson, also of York. Um, we're grateful for all four of you being here. Um, and uh, as I've said a number of times now, you've been very flexible with us and very patient as we've tried to figure out the hearing schedule around the floor schedule and the full committee. So um, we're grateful for that. If I could ask all four of you to stand and uh, again, to, uh, so I can swear you in uh, if you raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And the clerk will re reflect that all four witnesses affirmed the oath. And um, we're, we're going to set the clock at five minutes, but if you need a little more time than that, uh, you know, we want you to be uh, able to give uh, your testimony as you see fit, and we're, uh, we're glad to hear it. So, Mr. White, we'll start with you. Uh, Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, uh, thank you for inviting me. As you'll hear from the victims, ID theft related tax fraud is an insidious crime. To begin, I want to describe a hypothetical and simplified uh, example of refund fraud, which is illustrated on page three of my statement and I think up on the screen. First, a, th a thief steals a taxpayer's identity. This happens outside of IRS. Second, the thief files a tax return claiming a refund using the name and social security number of the innocent taxpayer. After verifying that the name and social security number match, and this again may be simplified, uh, then IRS issues a refund to the thief. Later, the legitimate taxpayer files a return. At that time, IRS discovers two returns have been filed using the same name and social security number. IRS holds up any refund while it notifies the taxpayer of a problem and investigates. The notification from IRS may be when the taxpayer first learns his or her identity has been stolen. Employment fraud is different. Um, also illustrated on the screen. With employment fraud, a thief uses a stolen name and social security number to get a job. The following year, when taxes are due, the employer reports the income to IRS on a wage statement, and the innocent taxpayer files a tax return. IRS matches the two and discovers income reported in the name of the innocent taxpayer that was not included on the taxpayer's return. IRS sends a notice of underreported income to the taxpayer, and that is when the taxpayer and IRS may first learn about the ID theft. So to summarize so far, IRS learns about an identity theft affecting taxpayers long after the theft occurs, and available, and available evidence suggests the problem is growing. Now I want to outline what IRS is doing to resolve taxpayers' ID theft problems, detect fraud, and prevent future problems. Starting in 2004, and the Commissioner summarized some of this, IRS created an ID theft strategy, set up an office to oversee it, put theft indicators on victims' accounts, screen some returns for fraud, and set up the Identity Protection Specialized Unit and an ID theft hotline. In 2009, we recommended that IRS develop measures and data for assessing the effectiveness of IRS's efforts. IRS agreed and has since taken new actions. To help resolve innocent taxpayers' problems, since identity theft makes it appear they either claimed two refunds or underreported their wage income, IRS is placing a temporary ID theft indicator on accounts while still investigating. The purpose is to alert all IRS offices that ID theft may be the explanation for what appears to be tax evasion. To detect ID theft related tax fraud, IRS screens returns filed in the names of past victims. The screens are not perfect. If, for example, IRS screens out returns with a change of address, it will slow refunds to some legitimate taxpayers who moved. If it screens too loosely, more fraudulent returns get through. 
This year, about 200,000 returns failed the screens, 146,000 were fraudulent, and 50,000 were innocent. Also, IRS is experimenting with screens for the Social Security numbers of deceased taxpayers to try to prevent thieves from filing using those identities. Another new step gives past fraud victims special PIN numbers. IRS screens out returns filed in the names of those taxpayers unless the PIN is attached. <coughs> IRS's ability to address identity theft is constrained by law, timing, and resources. The laws governing the privacy of taxpayer data limit uh, to some extent, as the Commissioner also described, IRS's ability to disclose information about suspected ID thieves to Federal, State, or local law enforcement agencies unless certain conditions are met. Complicating any investigation is the fact that IRS typically discovers the ID theft long after it occurred. Finally, criminal investigations require resources. Last year, IRS IRS initiated about 4,700 criminal investigations of all types, including ID theft, tax evasion, money laundering, and other financial crimes, far fewer than the number of ID theft cases. Given all of this, can IRS do more? Options exist, but they come with trade-offs. IRS could screen tax returns filed in the no names of known identity theft victims more tightly, but that will increase the number of false positives and delay refunds to those taxpayers. It could also uh, burden employers who could be contacted about reported wages. Looking forward, IRS needs to continue assessing its efforts, such as pins and screens for deceased taxpayers, to learn what is effective. We have not assessed the effectiveness of these steps. In the long term, IRS should be looking at how to take more advantage of the new processing systems it is building. With better processing, IRS might someday be able to match tax returns to wage statements before <laughs> refunds are issued and thus prevent more refund fraud. However, such pre-refund matching would require employers to file wage statements earlier in the year. Mr. Chairman, that completes my statement. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. White. Ms. Hawa. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Platts and Ranking Member uh, Towns. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to provide you with my testimony regarding this atrocious and rapidly increasing identity theft crime. It not only impacts individual livelihoods, but it also steals millions of dollars from the United States Treasury year after year and will continue to do so until something is done to prevent it. This unfortunate situation has taken a tremendous emotional toll on me. The stress, fear, and anxiety are all compounded by having to deal with terribly organized agencies such as the IRS and the Taxpayer Advocate Service, which only add to feeling victimized by their inefficient systems and lack of communication. Knowing that I and other legitimate taxpayers like me remain vulnerable tax season after tax season leaves me both infuriated, infuriated and, and it also frustrates me. In three years, thieves managed to steal my tax refunds twice by filing fraudulent tax returns in my name. The first time was in 2009 after I filed through my local tax preparation office as I had for the previous five years. Two days later, I received word that the IRS rejected my return because my Social Security number was used more than once. Scared and in shock, I immediately took measures to secure all of my personal assets, credit reports and accounts. I obtained a police report filed with the Federal Trade Commission and mailed in hard copies of my returns to various IRS addresses as instructed by different units within the IRS. After 12 months of back and forth confusion, the IRS's Identity Protection Specialized Unit assigned me to an incredibly rude and hard to reach taxpayer advocate where I had to explain my situation, resubmit the documents and prove my identity all over again. It took a painstaking 14 months until I finally received my $6,604 refund. Meanwhile, I had to take on a second job to support myself and spend a lot of time, money, and energy drafting letters and sending in the necessary information. In 2010, I was unaffected, but I still remained extremely anxious. When I finally received both my 2009 and 2010 tax refunds a few weeks apart, I hoped the worst was over. But this year I learned that I had fallen victim to this crime yet again, and this time they also stole my state refund, together totaling $6,335. Research has shown me just how antiquated the taxpayer system is. I realize that the IRS has been dealing with this crime since nearly the start of the millennium. So why do they seem so inexperienced and incompetent in handling the matter? And why hasn't anything been done yet to combat it? The very process designed to accommodate taxpayers has also become a windfall for thieves. 
There has been an increase in tax theft as a result of e-filing and direct deposit, which do not necessitate validating personal identity when filing. A digital signature to e-file simply requires a self-select personal identification number, which is the taxpayer's adjusted gross income from their previous year's return, information that is easily obtainable. Furthermore, direct deposit only requires a bank's routing number in order to release the funds. No further vetting of personal information or identity is required. So on two separate occasions, identity thieves e-filed early in the tax season before I physically received my W-2 forms and used direct deposit accounts to steal my refunds. To make matters worse, in 2009, they received $1,895 more than I was due, and I received a notice from the IRS stating that I owed that amount in overpayment. Electronic filing was created to save the IRS millions of dollars since every e-filed return cost the IRS 19 cents versus a paper return which cost $3.29. But I urge you instead to look at the many millions of dollars fraudulently paid out to these criminals. Cases jumped 644 percent from 2004 to 2007 and an additional 300 percent since last year, and many millions of taxpayer dollars are needlessly and disgustingly wasted due to this broken and exposed system. In an era where technology is so prevalent, one would hope that, a prior that priority would be placed on this issue. It is absolutely absurd that the government pays out twice on a single stolen refund, multiplied by hundreds of thousands of stolen refunds each year. Since the country is facing one of the worst economic situations in its history, this appalling travesty needs immediate attention and repair. This entire ordeal is in large part due to the unacceptable lack of security measures that the IRS and the U.S. government have placed on the personal identities of taxpayers. And as an upstanding citizen of this country, I demand change. I demand first that legislation be enacted to force federal and state tax offices to put appropriate measures in place that prevent thieves from taking the people's hard-earned refunds away from them and forcing them to fight for their identity and their tax refunds for the rest of their lives. I second demand that federal government work more closely with state and local law enforcement agencies to target and catch these criminals so that victims like me can rest better knowing that these criminals are serving time. And I third demand that each state develop and enact the necessary laws to protect consumers from corporate tax preparation offices that have few incentives to safeguard their customers' personal information. I hope that by hearing our testimony today, measures will be put in place that we will no longer have to deal with this nightmare any longer. I thank you for your time and your effort in making these critical changes happen now. Thank you, Ms. Hawa. Um, Ms. Petraco? Good afternoon. My story begins on March 15, 2011, when I retrieved my mail from my mailbox. I received an envelope from the Internal Revenue Service. Inside was a window envelope stamped by the Postal Service, returned to sender, attempted, not known, <coughs> unable to forward. Inside the window envelope was an IRS change of address form and, more importantly, a notice CP12 for tax year 2010, dated February 14, 2011. My Social Security number, my first and last name, which were all accurate, but an address of 45 Ludlow Street, Apartment 3B, Yonkers, New York, 10705. I had never lived at this, at this address, let alone ever lived in Yonkers or the State of New York. The form stated that I had a miscalculation on my 2010 form 1040EZ in the area of tax credits and that my new refund amount would be $4,552. I read this form several times in disbelief and called my husband. I knew my joint tax return was prepared by an accountant, that we use the 1040 long form since we have two children in college, and finally, that we had just mailed our return within the last two weeks. I wanted to believe an error was made that would explain this. I immediately called the IRS 1-800 number, but after 20 minutes on hold without being able to speak to anyone, I gave up. The local IRS office is about a mile from my home, but they were closed for the day, and so I spent a restless night wondering what this all means. March 16th, I arrived at our local IRS office early and was asked to step up to the counter. The clerk was courteous, but the counter is in no way private. Everyone sitting in the chairs directly behind me could hear our conversation, and the lobby was full. When I showed the clerk what I had received, and that this wasn't my return, she blurted out, your identity has been stolen. I will need to fill out an identity theft affidavit. 
The entire waiting room heard this. Until then, I was still hoping that was just a mix-up. She asked for my name and for me to recite my Social Security number. Just seconds ago, this IRS employee proclaimed that I had been a victim of identity theft and was at now asking me to recite where others could hear the same sensitive information she, she concluded had been stolen. I said no, that she could take the information from the form in front of her, and I would be happy to show her my driver's license. She asked, when did you lose your Social Security card? I replied, I didn't. She wanted to see it, but I don't carry it in my wallet because I don't want my identity stolen. She completed the affidavit and told me to come back with my Social Security card so that she could send the license and Social Security number with the affidavit. She also told me because this person filed the return as a single person and got $4,552 already, my legitimate return would be held up and that I would not see my refund until perhaps October or, no or November, roughly eight or nine months later. I asked her, how can a person file a return and without validation or proof of anything receive a refund? She replied, do you know how many people file electronically? We expedite the return and match up the information later. Finally, she said, don't forget to file a a report with the Federal Trade Commission, the Social Security Administration, and the three credit bureaus. Again, the clerk was courteous, but her matter-of-fact manner and abruptness that this happens all the time in front of a room full of strangers was upsetting. I went out to my car and cried. I was very overwhelmed. I was so upset that I began to wonder how far the thief would go. I went home, signed on to all three credit bureaus on the Internet, and reported the identity theft and printed my current reports. Everything was okay. I pulled up my bank accounts to see if my balances were okay. They were. I was late for work that day in order to protect all that I have worked hard for. I felt the need to report this to my supervisor as well as to the chief as I work in law enforcement and did not want someone to jeopardize my job or my good name. That evening, I filed a report with the Federal Trade Commission, and they requested that I file a police report with my local municipality. I am not sure why, because this is a cybercrime involving someone in Yonkers, New York, and not York, Pennsylvania. March 17th, I contacted the Springsbury Township Police Department and spoke to Detective Raymond E. Kroll and explained what had happened and what the Fed Federal Trade Commission requested. He was familiar with the Federal Trade Commission's request and gave me an incident report number, but stated he had no jurisdiction to investigate. I added the police department's incident report number to the Federal Trade Commission's website on my incident page. I again had to leave work early to go out to the Social Security Office in York, PA, to inform them of the identity theft. Unfortunately, at that time, they still didn't have my 2010 earnings to verify for accuracy. I was resigned to the fact that this nightmare would continue indefinitely, that the IRS would hang on to my tax refund, and that I would have to be vigilant with the credit bureaus for the rest of my life. On April 27th, I discovered I was not the only local government employee in York County affected by the identity theft via the IRS. One of these victims suggested that our local Congressman Todd Platts and his office could help. I followed through with contacting the York office and filling out the constituent service form with all related documentation. On April 28th, I told my story to two special agents from the Department of the Treasury out of Philadelphia who are also launching an investigation. I am here today to tell you that I am a victim of identity theft. I am forever changed. I will always need to check on my credit and be vigilant in what information is shared with others. I am a victim, being victimized by the IRS, who is holding up my refund because they don't have checks and balances in place to prevent crimes like this from happening, to timely verify personal and financial information, or to timely and adequately assist people like me who have fallen victim to identity theft. If they did, they would have seen the following things that I have filed my taxes with the same man as married filing jointly for the last 28 years, that I have lived at the same location for the last 12 years, and never filed any change of address with any other governmental agency, 
meaning Social Security or the Postal Service. And finally, that we always complete the 1040 long form and that we always file by mail and not by using the Internet. I thank you for the opportunity to tell my story in the hope that changes occur within the IRS that will prevent this from happening to others. Hopefully, my tax ref refund will not be delayed until October or November so that this law-abiding citizen can get back to living her life. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Petraco. Ms. Thompson. Good afternoon. My nightmare began on Monday, February 28, 2011. That day, my accountant was in the process of e-filing my Federal tax return. He received a message from a software provider alerting him that a tax return had already been filed for me. He responded by advising that it could not be filed already because he was trying to file it now. He then called the IRS and they, in fact, confirmed that a return had been filed in my name. My accountant called me and told me what happened. He gave me the number to the IRS to call and find out what the person used to file their return because they could not release that information to him. I called and was told they could not tell me anything. Once I got home from work, I called the IRS again and spoke with Mr. Baird. He told me what I had to do as far as filing an identity theft affidavit with copies of my driver's license and Social Security card, calling the Federal Trade Commission, filing a police report, contacting the Credit Bureau and Social Security Office. Once I finished speaking with him, I called the Federal Trade Commission and spoke with an employee whose name was Mark. He took a complaint and gave me a confirmation number. I called Social Security and was informed that I had to call the Federal Trade Commission and I informed the representative that I had just talked to someone. She said okay and wished me good luck. That day she said I was the fifth person that she had spoken with who had their identity stolen. On February 28, 2011, I filed an incident report with the York County, Pennsylvania District Attorney's Office. On March 1, 2011, I filed a police report with the York City Police Department. The detective found out who did it, but he could not charge the person because that person is reportedly located in the state of New Jersey. He was told the IRS would bring charges against them. On March 15, 2011, I forwarded a letter to the IRS with the following documents. Identity Theft Affidavit Form 14039, Preparer Explanation for Not Following the Electronically Form 8948, Incident investigation, investigation Information, Copies of My Social Security Card and Pennsylvania Driver's License. On March 16, 2011, at approximately 10.25 a.m., I called to get some information on my case because they would not release it to the detective and he wanted me to call and get it. I spoke with the most rude and discourteous person I have ever spoken with in my life. When I asked her about my case, she proceeded to yell and scream at me. When I asked for her name and ID number again because she said it so fast when she answered the telephone, the phone went silent. She had hung up the telephone. I then called the detective and told him what happened. He told me to calm down and call back and hopefully I would get another person. At 10.30 a.m., I called back and Mrs. Bennett answered. I could not stop crying and told her what had just happened to me when I had called a few moments earlier. Mrs. Bennett kept apologizing for the previous person, which she is not required to do so. She informed me that the person used my Social Security number, first and last name, no middle initial, to file that return. Once my return was received, the IRS considered it to be a duplicate return. On March 18, 2011, I wrote a letter to the IRS about the situation on March 16, 2011, and I did not get a response. On telephone calls monitored by the IRS, for the purpose of hearing what is being said. Is this unhelpful attitude toward the public a single incident or is it a general attitude? On March 30th, 2011 at 11.10 a.m., I called again to get an update and spoke with Mrs. Dandridge. She informed me that it would take 16 weeks to six months for me to receive my return because of the identity theft. I thanked her for her help. 
I had to close my checking and savings account and get a new one and order new checks because of this. An added expense, albeit a minor one, but one which I did not need. I had to pull my credit reports and luckily, so far, there has not been any activity on the part of the thief. I had to put a 90-day alert on my Social Security number. On May 10, 2011, I wrote a letter to Experion to put a permanent alert on my Social Security number. On May 17, 2011, I wrote letters to TransUnion and Equifax requesting the same. <clears throat> you may, may not be able to know how stressful this has been. I can't sleep. I wonder what the person will do next as far as trying to get credit cards or anything in my name. Now since this has happened, I am told the IRS will monitor my Social Security number for the next three years. When I file my return, it will take them longer to process it because of this. What, if anything, is the IRS doing to rectify that this does not happen again to me or another person? In my work history, I have had the occasion to see and work with victims of crime. I have seen the calming and encouraging effect of policemen a prosecutor or others involved in the criminal justice system have had on victims of crime. The system I work with made every effort to avoid victimizing a victim a second time. The way I feel I have been treated by the IRS system, I have been made a victim a second time. I ask and wonder how many people have had the same unpleasant experience. Lastly, on Tuesday, May 31, 2011, I received correspondence from the IRS dated May 13, 2011, regarding another individual filing a tax return using my Social Security number. This incident started February 28, 2011, and I am just now receiving correspondence. Why would it have take Why would it take three months for me to receive this information? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Thompson, and again, my thanks to all four of our witnesses and to our three citizen witnesses, um, uh, the victims of identity theft. I want to add my words of apology uh, to uh, the commissioners uh, on behalf of uh, not specifically the IRS, but on behalf of our federal government for how uh, each of you have been treated as law-abiding citizens seeking to comply with your obligations as taxpayers and instead becoming victims uh, not just of, of criminal conduct of the uh, those who sought to um, defraud you, but also victims of um, poor service from us, the federal government. And um, all of us uh, bear responsibility for that ultimately, and especially as uh, uh, elected representative of two of you. And, and uh, you know, I know for uh, our third witness, um, you know, on behalf of all my colleagues, we, we want to do better on, uh, on your behalf. Um, I want to kind of focus a couple questions with number with you three and then Mr. White separately, because, uh, um, and, and maybe Mr. White uh, actually ask you first, oh, find my uh, notes here, apologize. Here we go. Um, in, in the Commissioner's testimony and then also in your written testimony and um, in your testimony here today, Mr. White, you talked about the, the filter or the screening, screening process. Um, and I'm not sure what, if, if any detail, GAOs reviewed that uh, as far as how that filter process works and, and whether you're able to make any assessment of uh, it kind of relates to my questions earlier is where we have these three witnesses uh, or others um, where it would seem that while it's worked certainly in the 140,000 or so, uh, clearly it's let others slip through that seem to have a fair number of red flags that didn't get caught up. I'm not sure if you can give an opinion on, on how to assess that process. We haven't assessed it ourselves. I can say several things, though. One, the filter process does not work perfectly, as we've heard. Um, and it, it does stop some 
fraudulent returns and some fraudulent refunds from going out the door at IRS. However, they are both false positives and false negatives. So this past year, so, so far in 2011, <coughs> there has been about 50,000 false positive. Those are returns of honest taxpayers that got stopped by the filters by mistake. So that creates a burden on those taxpayers. And then on the other side, you have false negatives where fraudulent returns slipped through the filters, uh, perhaps because the ID theft stole so much of the um, honest taxpayers' identity that they could get through the filters. They had enough information to get through. So you've got both kinds of problems there. Uh, the filters don't work perfectly. Um, we've recommended that what IRS needs to be doing, and they've agreed with our recommendation and started doing this, they need to be assessing every year the effectiveness of the actions they're taking. They've, they've taken a number of steps. They're, they're taking a number of new steps this year. Each year they need to be assessing those steps and then feeding back. There needs to be a feedback loop where they learn from what they've done and then correct and adjust appropriately. Part of the problem here is that the thieves are adjusting as well. And yeah. so it needs to be a continuous process by IRS. They have started that. In, in essence, um, what I would call uh, annually auditing their internal control system to prevent this type of fraud from occurring. Yes, to learn what's working, what's not working, do more of what is working. If the PIN numbers, for example, turn out to work well in their experiment, then that would be something to think about expanding, obviously. Uh, and on that specific, I know they're looking as, you know, at the results of that pilot. Uh, is that anything that GAO, that you're engaged with IRS in, in assessing the, that pilot program? Uh, no, we are not. Our, our sense, though, based on the work we did in 2009, is that the PIN uh, seems to be a promising approach. Now, it depends on taxpayers using it for it to work, um, but it ought to be an addition. Or it seems like it has the potential to be an addition to the filter system that would make that system work more effectively than it does right now. Okay. The, the problem is if an ID theft has stolen a lot of a taxpayer's identity, um, more than just a name and social security number, they can make up a return that will look realistic. They may have a copy of last year's tax yeah. return. Um, so they can get through the filters. The PIN is a number that only the honest taxpayer would have um, unless the thief is hacking into their home computer, for example. It's, it, there is no perfect solution here, but that is a solution that seems to have a lot of potential. Yeah, uh, and that, that from what I have come to learn seems to be the, the more we can expand that effort if the data you know, plays out as it seems yeah. like it may, uh, that, you know, that will be one way to really try to crack down and, and prevent this fraud from occurring. Yeah. And then I do think there are some long-term solutions here. These are years away. Uh, but, for example, right now IRS does not match tax returns to the wage statements, the W-2s that employers file until months after the filing season ends. The first match is done in June. Part of the reason for that is employers don't have to send those uh, information returns to IRS until either the end of February or the end of March. Then IRS matches later. So the refunds go out the door first, and then that kind of matching is done afterwards. If IRS can modernize their processing systems, and if the due date for those employer wage statements could be moved earlier in the year, IRS could do matching before refunds go out and catch more refund fraud. But that's like, this is something that's years away. They're working on their processing systems, but they're, they're not where they need to be right now. And, and that is uh, as part of my conversation with the Commissioner in his April uh, test or, or speech reference that, yes. you know, looking ahead and, and him trying to, again, be proactive in the long term. Um, and I didn't get the chance to ask him that question because the fact that we're providing W-2s to the employee by the end of January, you, you, once that employer you know, makes that available to the employee, it would seem that why wait another month or more before having it also shared? So that alone would hopefully allow us to move it up just that one change, um, you know, the earlier the better. So Yes. We've, we've got some work ongoing uh, for the Ways and Means Committee where we're, we're looking at this, trying to see if there are some options to move that up. Great. Uh, before I um, go to, uh, to our other witnesses, I'm going to yield to the gentleman from Mr. Towns for a uh, uh, purpose of questions, and then I'll come back um, with other questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And also let me um, say to the witnesses, you know, uh, really 
apologize. We regret that that happened, you know, but we happy that you able to take the time to come in and share with us in terms of what occurred. I really appreciate that. Um, Mrs. Petraco, um, as I understand it, you discovered that your identity was compromised after receiving an ad address change request? That, yes. Okay. Was the identity thief attempting to change your York, Pennsylvania address to a Yonkers, New York address? Could you explain that? Um, the um, letter I received um, had the, the change of address, the, the, the envelope that went to Yonkers and was rejected went back to the IRS. The IRS put it in another envelope and hand wrote my name and address. Um, I guess I got it from their files. Um, and then that envelope came to me at my legitimate address in York, Pennsylvania. And so when I opened it up, I saw this Yonkers, New York address, and I knew something was wrong. Right. Has there been any other attempts to use your information? N no. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first. No credit cards or anything like that have been used? No. Mm -hmm. So far now, as it appears that your ID was simply used to just commit tax fund fraud, that's what it was used for? Correct. Yeah. Do you know anything about the status of the investigation being uh, conducted by the Treasury Department? No. Since I have been to the IRS office, I have heard nothing except through off, um, Mr. Platt's office. Right. But in other words, you, they have not been in touch with you? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is Hawa that it? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, has your ID or any of the other two victims been used for purpose other than tax refund fraud? Have you, they used anything else? Not like to my knowledge. Not like credit card. How long did it take you to get assigned an agent while you were waiting for 16 months? Um, the first year I was dealing with various agents within the IRS for about 12 months. And then after 12 months, they assigned me to a national uh, a taxpayer advocate service agent who have then you, who who continued the quest to get my refund right have you received your refund from 2008 it took uh, 14 months but this year uh, no but i was just contacted saying that i was going to get it within 10 days okay yeah. and this year i did not get uh, assigned an agent at all good uh, do you have any indication that action is being taken by the IRS to find and prosecute the person that used your identity? It's very difficult to get information about the fraudulent claim, um, just getting information about how much the refund was for when it was issued is not something that they freely share. Um, and that is after they use the verifiers to identify that you're the legitimate taxpayer. Um, so, no, I, aside from just the basic information which I had to plead, plead for, I, did, I have no idea where the status is on, my, on the criminal investigation. Right. Let me ask you also, do you have any idea as to where your identity was stolen, I mean, in terms of what happened as to how they were able to ascertain it? And I'll ask all three of you that. Uh, for me, in 2009, it started when I went to a local tax preparation office mm -hmm. in my neighborhood. I had been going to this tax preparation office for five, five years, um, and I realized that it was a tax preparation office when 20 additional customers of this office came forward and said the same thing happened to them. Wow. Mm -hmm. Ms. Ms. I have no idea. To the best of my knowledge, I thought everything was secure. Ms. Thompson? No, I have no idea. Right. Let me just go over you to um, Mr. White. Uh, you talked about the appropriate procedures uh, should be put in place, and you also talked about you know, modernizing the system. Uh, that, that costs money, doesn't it? Um, to modernize the system. It, IRS has spent a lot of money modernizing their systems to date. Uh, they've made progress. We've been reporting on this at GAO for a long time now. Uh, and after Congress passed the IRS Restructuring Act in 1998, um, IRS got much better at managing systems modernization. Uh, it's still not where it needs to be 
to do the sort of pre-refund matching we're talking about. Uh, they're probably several years away from that right now. Right. I'm concerned about this money. That's, you know, everybody's concerned about, you know, and I'm, I'm just thinking that sometimes, you know, we sort of react to things and when we should spend and we would save, we ended up not spending and ended up costing us more. You know, it happens. I think that uh, uh, we do that a lot, especially in government. So uh, I'm just concerned about that. I think we have to sort of make the point because I really view that this is very, very serious. If a person is waiting for his or her money and is stolen and they're sitting waiting, I mean, that's very, very frustrating. Um, I, I agree. Um, IRS, is, as you may know, has a separate appropriations account for sy uh, systems modernization, and under the law, GAO um, looks at that um, account before they can spend money out of it, and the, the balancing act has always been uh, making sure that IRS had the management capacity and the controls in place to be able to spend that mo money smartly so that they didn't get um, more money than they could spend effectively. Uh, but enough so that they continue to make progress modernizing. Yeah. Let me just say what my real concern here is, and, and you know, aside from the fact that a person uh, um, uh, has lost, but you know, I'm thinking in reference to credit scores and uh, employment or other things, all the negative things that can happen, you know, as a, you could be impacted by this. I mean, you know, um, and, I, and, and, and how about, may I ask you, how about your credit score and if, have you dealt with this? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm going to go right down the line, Ms. Okay. Hawaii. Um, well, I, I, I'm cautious to begin with, so even prior to this incident happening the first year, I always kept up on my credit reporting agencies and I always had freezes on my accounts. Um, so this just exacerbated my need to continue the freezes and always be on top of my accounts. I mean, this is going to be a lifelong issue to deal with. It's not, even if my taxes aren't stolen next year, I'm still going to be concerned that my identity is, you know, compromised and I'll have to worry about accounts being open in my name and, and whatnot. So this is not just a, a one-time thing that we have to deal with. This is a lifetime issue. Ms. Petraco. Um, I agree. Uh, it, I don't see this ending for me anytime soon. Currently, it's just the IRS, but I will be vigilant about the the, the credit scores because you know I work in law enforcement. So the the bigger impact for me is just you know the fact that I am the law abiding citizen. I'm supposed to be pro protecting others um, in my role. Um, so it does have an impact. You know, because I don't know what what way this person is going to use my identity, and my my name is unique, so um, you know that that limits the amount of um, people that have that name right. out there. So it's me. Yeah, uh, Miss Thompson. It's been approximately, I think, three months uh, since you discovered that your identity was used to commit tax fraud. Uh, you also reported the problem to the IRS and the FTC. Is that correct? Yes. Right. Have you received any written communications from either of those agencies? Federal Trade Commission wrote me a letter, had my confirmation number on it. IRS, I never got anything from except the letter that I just got the other day. Mm -hmm. What did that basically say? I mean, that letter. an individual used my Social Security number to file a return, but that was three months ago, and it's telling me what to do as far as the affidavit and contacting the Federal Trade Commission, but I already did all that, so it's three months late. Right. Did you contact the uh, York PD? Yes. Yeah. What was their response? They have a police report, and so does the district attorney's office. Right. Would they appear that, to be investigating? Would you Would you know? The York City Police Department found an address and a name in New Jersey, but the IRS, when they came to talk to us the other month, said that he, he can't arrest her. They're going to arrest her. Said he can't touch her. They, would they you mean, when you say they are going to arrest her, you mean the... The IRS. Uh, IRS. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you received either written or verbal communication from the IRS which uh, gives up, 
give you an update on uh, the progress of tax fraud. Have you? No. No progress report, just the no, one nothing. letter, and that's mm -hmm. it. Huh? You know, um, Mr. Chairman, I think that's a real issue in terms of um, the amount that is involved, because if a person discovers that if it's three thousand or five thousand dollars, and nothing is going to happen, the IRS is not going to pursue it, and nobody, you know, why not do it again next year? You know, that might be the way you make your living from this point on until something is done about it. So I think that we need to look at the the um, um, possible legislation that would encourage local law enforcement to also get involved in terms of. Um, uh, even if it's a thousand dollars, five hundred, it doesn't matter. It's not theirs. And I think that until we come up with something of that nature, I think that this is going to continue. And I must say that uh, uh, we need to do everything we can to make certain that it does not continue. And I think that we might need to look at some legislation here. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman and um, share. Uh, the gentleman from New York's interest in, in pursuing this further, uh, uh, specifically on the prosecution standpoint, um, as uh, with our conversation with the Commissioner um, and with GAO, of, of what, if any, current statutes prohibit the sharing of information from the IRS with local law enforcement. And they they you know, partner with justice, but as I um, kind of referenced earlier, you know, you know, when we're talking about a three thousand dollar case here or four thousand dollar justice, you know, is is got limited resources as well. But our local law enforcement, you know, they're pretty efficient in dealing with these type of cases. So, um, you know, I, I think, and this is something I've conveyed to our, our citizens who are with us, that when this hearing ends, this you know, effort doesn't end, right. and that that we'll continue to work, uh, you know, in a in a nonpartisan way with the committee, with GAO, with the um, uh, IRS uh, officials to see how do we strengthen that ability because I'm one who believes you know, exactly what you said. If if we don't start sending a message that whether it's a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, you know we're coming after you if you steal money from the American taxpayers and you victimize law-abiding citizens. We're not going to just ignore that. We're going to go after it and try to you know hold you accountable. So look forward to doing that. Um, you and myself uh, time um, now. Um, I, I think first of all to our to our three um, victims here. Um, one, a, a sincere thanks for your willing to tell your stories because by being here, you help raise public awareness of this issue. You personalize it. You humanize it. That this isn't just about improper payments being made by the federal government to criminals. You know, and and you know the this is um, one piece of a huge huge um, uh, pie of improper payments. Uh, the official number most recent is $125 billion a year of improper payments being made. And, and what is going on here is, is one part of that, um, you know, that you know, millions and millions of dollars going out in fraudulent tax refunds. So you are helping to tell your story uh, is uh, very important. And in each of your statements, you captured it in different ways uh, from a the need for us to work with the Commissioner and his staff to strengthen the training of IRS agents and how we um, assist victims of crime, which is what each of you are. And, and you stated it in different ways, but I think you know, stated it very well in uh, Ms. Petraco, you know, um, I'm here today to tell you that I'm a victim of identity theft. I'm forever changed. Ms. Thompson, uh, quote, the, the way I feel I've been treated by the IRS system has made me a victim a second time. Um, Ms. Hawa, your statement, they continue to treat me as if I am the one to blame, adding even more stress to the situation. You know, that, that's not acceptable. And, and the Commissioner acknowledged that. And, and I appreciate the Commissioner's uh, colleagues staying to, to hear your stories. Um, if, if, uh, if you haven't had the chance, um, uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Beth Tucker, who is here with us, um, you know, she was part of my meeting with, uh, with uh, Commissioner Shulman yesterday, um, understands the importance of us doing right by you and, and all victims of this type of, of criminal conduct. Um, and um, I think captures the earlier when I referenced that each of you unfortunately dealt with IRS uh, agents who were not living up to the standard of assistance, um, as you well reflected in your 
uh, statements and your testimony. Um, Deputy Commissioner uh, Tucker is a 27-year employee of the IRS dedicated to doing right by you, and, and her presence here today reflects that along with her colleagues. Um, in, in I, I guess a couple of specific questions, and Mr. Towns touched on a number of them from the prosecution standpoint of, of what you've been told or what action you're aware of. Um, on how the interactions with the IRS went, a couple additional questions. Um, Ms. Howell, I want to make sure I understand one part of your written testimony and what you shared here today. Um, when you were, uh, find my, my spot again. You were con uh, contacted in October of 2009, um, and I, I believe it, by writing, in writing, that you owed a amount of $1,895 back to the IRS. Correct. And, and that amount was the difference between what you were lawfully in, supposed to get and the amount that the criminal had gotten uh, fraudulently, correct? That's correct. Um, this, by this time, though, you were already dealing with you know, representatives of the IRS, you know, employees, right, to kind of go after this, uh, the identity theft that occurred, correct? Yes, but I didn't have one person I was dealing with. I would just talk to the uh, Identity Protection Specialized Unit. Every time I called, it was a different agent. So I didn't know how consistent my profile showed that I was a okay. victim. Um, that kind of captures what the Commissioner and I, and when we talked about the training aspect of um, you know that there, there's a, a breakdown in the in, in the training system that you know not just in the training but in the internal tracking system I guess is how I describe it that you're already in the system working on identity theft and I assume probably maybe seven or eight months in to doing that because this is the fall mm -hmm. yet the system kicked out a hey we overpaid you well they did overpay <laughs> But not you, right? And 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 they overpaid the other person the full amount. Um, and also, uh, when when you were dealing with um, uh, not those in the identity protection, the, the specialized unit, but also understand that two of the general agents that you dealt with were not aware of that there was a, a specific unit to deal with the victims of identity theft. That's correct. This year when it happened to me, I had lost the number for the identity uh, theft unit. So I called the general 800 number um, just thinking that they would uh, transfer. And when I asked, they had no idea what unit I was even referring to. And they were giving me different instructions on how to deal with um, filing my paper return, addresses to send to, and what I really needed to, to file. Right. Not understanding. The, the scope of the issue you were trying to deal with, which was That's knowing that you, because you'd unfortunately been through it before, you knew what was going on right. and trying to get to the bottom of it. And and I, you know, I um I think um, well, I, I'm I'm grateful for the commissioner's statement that you know, that those agents that don't typically deal with identity theft that that. That's part of their review of how they can strengthen that training. So, when someone such as yourself calls in, um, another one other specific question to you, Ms. Howell, is that: Am I correct to understand that that after 2009, um, and and you were supposed to be flagged, but were you also given a PIN number, or you were supposed to be given a PIN, or? I had requested a PIN because um, I'd heard murmurings of of people being issued out PINs uh, when this first happened to me. Um, even a, a gentleman that had <coughs> this happen, this happened to him earlier in 2000, and he said that he received a PIN or some sort of verification method, so it didn't okay. happen to him again. So I requested that immediately, and um, they told me that they were going to look into it, and I never received it. Then in 2010, I was not impacted at all. So I thought that the worst was over, so I wasn't going to bother the IRS for a PIN number. But then this year, when I found out it happened to me all over again, when I called the IRS to see why my profile wasn't flagged, as they had promised, they didn't know why, and they had no explanation. So it was actually back in 2009, and, and where you were told to be flagged, um, you were asked for a PIN, that didn't happen, but you thought you were still flagged, but then in 11, something, you know, it still, you know, that didn't work. That's correct. So, and, and that kind of comes to our discussions with the Commissioner, with Mr. White, that 
Um, hopefully that if we are able to expand that PIN uh, process, that it will be more exact. Um, and, and the three of you being examples are if next year you have to have that personal identification number that, you know, then it's not a question of, of you know, it being flagged, but hey, only you can file and, uh, and be able to. Uh, with one caveat, and Mr. White hit it, is depending on how you receive that, if it was electronically, you know, like a personal email versus mail or even mail, that, you know, that that PIN isn't, you know, uh, stolen, you know, that uh, in, in some fashion. So, but uh, certainly would be another hurdle f to guard against it. Um, I think I had one or two other ones. Um, now, I appreciate everyone's patience here. Uh, and, and this kind of, uh, Ms. Thompson, uh, Mr. Towns, I think, are pretty well covered this. When you were dealing with the York City detective, um, York City Police Department detective, mm -hmm. um, understanding that because of the, the person identified as being the, the, the criminal here was in New Jersey, they weren't going to be pursuing it, IRS would. Were you told over the phone by the IRS that they would be pursuing it, or, or were you told by the detective that his understanding from the IRS, you know? When the two IRS agents came a couple months ago to talk to us, they had told the detective that he could not arrest her, that the IRS would. Okay, so when, um, and that was kind of when we engaged, the, the, from a casework standpoint, they came out to look into you yeah. from the Philadelphia yeah. office? Yes. But you have not received any feedback about that since then no. from either of those Nothing agents? Nothing at all. Okay. Um, and look here a second. A, um, a, a final question, uh, Ms. Petraco. When you were in the, the York office and understandably rattled, one, because you are just trying to figure out what is going on here, and then already um, you know, being a little concerned and then being told that you're a victim of identity theft and then the engagement that happened in the public setting. Um, just, I guess, in general, uh, how would you, did, the, did the agent that you're dealing with understand or get it when you didn't want to say the information publicly with uh, the other people sitting there listening? Um, was there just a, uh, a, you know, that an understanding, oh, you know, sorry about that, or was it just more of a, they didn't realize what they were doing. Um, I think my tone of voice when I said no, I'm you know I'm no get the information off the form. She goes okay okay. Um, so you know I don't you know, I just don't think she really thought about what she was saying yeah, or just, you know just really didn't put it all together. It was more, more just pro forma. Hey, name, social security number. Right, right, and not thinking. You know, yes. not you know thinking that wait a minute, you know I've got to be, and because I, I asked that because it, it it's again in the issue of uh, training of 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 um, the sensitivity of this information that we are always on guard because I'm I'm like each of you have described your own approaches, you know my wife thinks you know I have a, you know a top shredder at home you know anything that has any kind of identifying goes into that shredder you know I've for years have been trying to be very protective because of this very concern. And it sounds like each of you have tried to do that. Um, and unfortunately, it uh, w wasn't enough, not because of lack of effort uh, on your part. So um, I don't have any other questions, Mr. Towns, do you? No, uh, I don't. I, I really don't. But um, as I indicated, though, I just think that a lot of things could sort of fall through the crack and not be dealt with, you know. For instance, that if the person is in another state and it's not a lot of money, that it could very easily almost be ignored because if you have to, if it's $750, so therefore why would you spend 15000 to collect the 750 So you just sort of pass it along. And that's my concern. So I'm not sure yeah. that we, we, we need to look at that because if they're saying that the person in York cannot make the arrest, and I'm not sure that the arrest is going to be made. And I think the fact that there's no communication, 
um, uh, to me is very troubling because the person that the victim should be informed as to what's really going on. And, um, and I think that's something that really needs to look at because I also understand in terms of the RS, I mean, how much do you want to spend to collect $500,000? I mean, $500. Yeah. You know, so I think that we have to look at this, and I think we have a role to play here, uh, and it's not just the blame game. I yeah, think it's that we need to do some things legislatively to sort of uh, make it possible for anybody that takes anybody else's money that they should be charged. Yes. Well, Mr. I, White, I think one of the, yeah. yeah. Um, just following up on that point, I, I agree completely with the point, and I think the solution is to take the profit out of the crime, and you do that with better filters. So in the short term, if these PIN numbers can be made to work, um, that would reduce the profit from the crooks. Um, they lose the ability to make money off of IRS. Longer term, if there could be more pre-refund checking, again, that takes the profit out of the crime, because you're absolutely right. Chase, um, IRS doesn't have the resources and never will and probably should not to chase $500. It costs <laughs> them much more than that to collect it. So it's got to be prevented up front. But the person that is, is, is the victim Yes. feels that you know, I mean, it, it differently, and I think Ab that's, and that's the way they should feel. Yeah, Absolutely. That's why this is such an insidious crime. For the victims, it is a big deal. Right. On that note, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I would maybe wrap up kind of that discussion you just had where I started in the, in the kind of the three primary issues is if we do better up front on, on internal controls and, and the PIN being one example of that, and even the filtering system. And, and that's why in, um, in my questions or comments earlier about the more flags that go off, and uh, I think, Mr. Petraka, you went through in your testimony all the things that were, you know, have not changed in 28 years, you know, your, your, your status, your address, you know, that the filtering system itself, if it's a January return asking for a debit card refund, you know, uh, and, and without any substanti substantiating documents, that should be a big red flag. Um, if we get into those who may be, you know, uh, likely identity theft victims, we have the PIN. The more we do up front reduces the number of fraud cases, and so that when they do occur, uh, there are fewer to pursue, to throw the book at, to go after Mr. Townsend's point that the message is, no, $3,000 or not, we're coming after you, because otherwise, if, if someone knows and just, hey, every year I can get an extra three to 5,000, do it once a year. You know, so reduce the number so then that the, there's fewer to go after to really hold accountable. And then third is, um, in doing that, we do better with victims' assistance because, you know, I'm not a law enforcement uh, professional, but my understanding is where there is criminal conduct and, you know, victims of, of crime, an important part of the healing process is the victim being kept fully informed all the way through that process of pursuing the criminal, the wrongdoing, to know that ultimately um, it's not just that you know, they were made whole, as we're, you're going to be made whole, you're going to get your refunds, but that um, justice was served. And, and, and I think that's when we have, no matter what the dollar amount, that we're not pursuing them, you know, justice isn't served, that, that prevents that ultimate healing process for the victims. And, and so I think prevention, prosecution, victims' assistance, and, you know, and I think you know, by his statements, the, the Commissioner understands that and, and is committed to that, not just today, but has been, but you know, we need to partner with them and, and, and with the Deputy Commissioner and this committee and uh, appropriations and make sure that we're, uh, we're well um, devoting the, the necessary um, time, effort, and resources to this issue. So my thanks again for our four witnesses here on this panel, to our IRS officials who are still here, and Commissioner Shulman on the first panel, um, certainly uh, have helped raise uh, great awareness of this issue and allow us as a committee to be more effective going forward to uh, try to make sure that you three certainly are never again victimized in this way as well as other Americans are not victimized as you have been. And uh, we do right by you and do right by taxpayers in uh, 
better protecting the, their hard-earned dollars that they send to the federal government. Uh, we will keep the, the hearing open for uh, two weeks for any additional information that either we've requested or that you um, want to submit to the committee um, to supplement the record. Uh, with that, this hearing stands adjourned. <laughs>